Hey everybody. In this video, we're going to look at improper integrals. In particular, we're going to look at a special kind of integral where we attempt a definite integration on a semi-infinite interval. So let's be a little more specific about this. In this video, we will make sense of so-called improper integrals of the form integral from a to infinity of a function and the integral from negative infinity to b. So we have sort of semi-infinite intervals where we have a fixed endpoint on one side and then the other endpoint runs off to either positive or negative infinity. Let's start by looking at a concrete example. Suppose we have the function 1 over x squared, and our goal is to find the area under the graph to the right of x equals 1. So we have this region here that sort of runs off to infinity. Now usually we'd like to evaluate a definite integral to find signed area under a curve. But we seem to be integrating from 1 to infinity. So we would naively write down a symbol that looks like this, the integral from 1 to infinity. But really, how does this make sense? What are we really trying to accomplish here? And if you start with first principles, you could say, well, let's do what we did for definite integrals before. We'll try to think of this as a limit of Riemann sums. However, any Riemann sum must either contain an infinite number of subintervals, because you've chopped up this infinite interval into pieces of finite width, so you'll have to have infinitely many subintervals, or if you choose to have a finite number of subintervals, then you'll have to have a subinterval of infinite width. So either option is trouble. The second option actually leads to an infinite value for your Riemann sum, so that's no good at all. And the first option requires the theory of infinite series to deal with. That's the theory that involves um, working with infinite collections of numbers that you try to add together. So uh, this does not seem to be a promising route. Let's remember uh, a theme of calculus that you've seen now several times. A new and unfamiliar calculation can often be constructed out of old and familiar calculations by taking a limiting value. So for example, a tangent slope can be obtained by looking at secant slopes and then looking at the limiting value. And to be particular about it, here is a secant slope, an average rate of change of the function f on an interval from a to x. And if you look at the limit of that quantity as x approaches a, then what you will obtain is the value of the tangent slope at a by definition. Similarly, how do we make sense of signed area under a graph? Well, we could look at Riemann sums, which make perfect sense because these are simply sums of areas of rectangles, which we know well. And then we would look at the appropriate limiting value. And just to be more particular, uh, a Riemann sum, we could denote f with a de decorated partition p. And then as long as the partitions become more and more efficient, which is to say the partition size goes to zero, this will give you by definition the so-called definite integral of f on the interval from a to b. So how do we play this game in this case? Well, we could choose some argument greater than 1, and then we'll evaluate the definite integral from 1 to that argument, and then we will let the argument itself go to infinity, and we will attempt to look at the limiting value of this definite integral as b goes to infinity. So in this case, we would take the limit as b goes to infinity of the integral from 1 to b. This will be our definition of what it means to integrate to infinity. Now let's just concentrate on evaluating this definite integral, and then we'll come back to the problem of the limiting value. An antiderivative of 1 over x squared is negative 1 over x. We evaluate at b and 1 and subtract and we get the quantity 1 minus 1 over b. Now we'll return to the limiting value. The limiting value of this quantity as b goes to infinity is clearly 1. And so our definition yields that the integral is equal to 1. Now this is an example of what we call an improper integral. We're trying to integrate off to infinity. And anytime we do that, we'll try to make sense of it as a limiting value of integrals over finite intervals. Now in this case, we'll say the interval converges to the value 1 because we get a limiting value. It's equal to 1. So that's what we say the interval converges to. And our interpretation is this region, although it's infinitely wide, has finite area. It actually has area equal to 1. So here's officially our definition of an improper integral to infinity. We've got our function whose domain is an interval that starts at a and runs off to infinity. And if we want to integrate on this interval, 
we'll integrate over a finite interval from A to B, and then we'll look at the limiting value as B goes to infinity. When the limit exists, we say the integral converges to that limiting value. And when the limit fails to exist, we say the integral diverges. So let's take a look at the reciprocal function. We'll try to integrate this from 1 to infinity. Now in this case, the antiderivative is the logarithm. Logarithm the b minus logarithm of 1, and then to take the limiting value of that as b goes to infinity. This will just give us ln of b minus ln of 1 is 0. So we're really looking at the limiting value of ln of b as b goes to infinity. But when we recall what the graph of the logarithm function looks like, we realize that this limit has to diverge to infinity. So in fact, this would be an example of a divergent improper integral. And in fact, we could say this integral diverges to infinity because the limiting value is unbounded and increases, diverges off to infinity. And we'll notice that if we were to overlay the graph of 1 over x squared, the regions we're looking at are qualitatively quite similar. And although the regions do look similar, in fact, this new region we just calculated actually has infinite area. So somehow the, the other uh, region has area equal to 1, and this region we just calculated is actually, it actually has infinite area, which might be surprising, but this is the sort of thing you need to get used to with these improper integrals. Don't get fooled by the looks of things. Let's try the integral of cosine from 0 to infinity. So here's a graph on the domain, and we'll notice that um, the areas cancel on the interval from 0 to pi. And if we keep moving pi units to the right, we can keep finding regions that cancel. So you might think that this integral surely is 0 because um, all the areas cancel. Surely this is true by some sort of infinite cancellation principle. But intuition should not take the place of the official definition. Hopefully at this point you've realized in calculus you have to be very careful when you're dealing with infinite calculations. Um, calculations involving infinite numbers of terms or quantities that become infinite or quantities that become infinitely small. You, you, you have to make your definitions and follow those rules. So we're not going to rely on intuition just to declare that this is zero. We have to define the integral by taking the integral from zero to k and then looking at the limit as k goes to infinity. So we'll play the game officially. The antiderivative of cosine is sine. Plug in k, plug in 0, evaluate that function, and subtract. And then we'll take the limit as k goes to infinity. So in the end, you have the limiting value as k goes to infinity of sine k. But remember, sine oscillates, oscillates on its whole domain. The limit as x goes to infinity of sine x does not exist. The value bounces back and forth between negative 1 and 1, but it never settles down. So this actually doesn't have a limiting value. So in this case, the limit doesn't exist, and what we have just discovered is that this improper integral diverges. And we don't even get to say it diverges to anything in particular, like infinity or negative infinity. It just flat out diverges. We don't assign an area to this. So we, we, we don't think of this area as being defined. Um, and, you know, you might object and you say, what's wrong with the infinite cancellation principle? Surely there's no harm in declaring that area to be zero since all those parts cancel. But really, you have to be aware that this can lead to trouble. So if you imagine that this is actually equal to zero using the cancellation principle, well, you could say that this integral should be evaluated by going from zero to pi over two first, and then going from pi over two to infinity. That seems to be a reasonable application of the interval combination law. And this integral is one, a fact you can calculate quite easily. And then what happens is, the infinite cancellation law seems to tell you that all these pieces now cancel. So this last integral from pi over 2 to infinity should be 0. And now you're really in trouble because you've just proved that 0 equals 1. This is a real problem. Once you've proved a contradiction, you can prove anything you want. So the infinite cancellation principle is actually wrong. Uh, if you try to apply it, it'll lead to contradictions. Example C. This time we're going to integrate from negative infinity to a finite argument. And in this case, our function, our integrand function, will be 1 over x squared plus 1. 
So we're looking for the area of this region here to the left of the origin. Now, we haven't talked about this, but it's pretty clear how we should proceed. We're going to integrate from some argument k, which is less than zero. We're going to integrate from k to zero, and then we're going to look at the limit as k goes to negative infinity. Now, the antiderivative of one over x squared plus one is arctan. Plug in zero, plug in k, and subtract, and then take the limit as k goes to negative infinity. So we'll have arctan of zero minus arctan of k, and let's remember what the arctan function looks like. It actually has, uh, horizontal asymptotes forward at pi over two and backwards at negative pi over two. And arctan of zero is zero. So what we're looking at here, we'll factor this negative sign out in front of the limit. And as k goes to negative infinity, the limit of arctan is negative pi over two. So it's negative negative pi over two is the limiting value or just pi over two. And that's consistent with what we see being a positive area. So there you have it. When you attempt to evaluate an improper integral on a semi-infinite interval, you should evaluate the integral on a finite interval and then let the appropriate endpoint run off to either positive or negative infinity as the case may be.